quirkier stories of the week. Two Mormon missionaries with evangelism in their hearts knocked on the door of a house in St. Albans. Do you know about God, they asked the surprised woman of the house. Yes, replied uh, Mrs. Runcie. My husband was the Archbishop of Canterbury for ten years. <laughs> what can you say to that? Another surprising reaction met enthusiastic chorister John King as he sang with the choir of St. Luke's Church Langold. After a particularly emotional burst of singing, he was asked to leave the choir. You sound like Des O'Connor on a bad day, he was told. Well, they should have given him top billing because Des still packs him in. A priest in Livorno, Italy, has his finger more keenly on popular taste. Father Luca Soleimani uses a karaoke machine to lead the hymns. And one of the congregation said, it's great, it's just like the bar down the road. <laughs> well, summer is here, that is official. Yesterday was May Day, the start of Beltane season, when our Celtic ancestors celebrated the renewal of life and their thoughts turned to the land. And today, we all look forward to longer and hopefully hotter summer days. Nature, rebirth and change are also at the heart of what's become known as New Age thinking. New Agers, like Malcolm and Amanda Stern, hope to change the world by changing themselves. The couple are members of a community in Dorset who believe that the dawning of a new age, the age of Aquarius, is already upon us. I think what's happening at the moment on this planet and the reason why people are so scared of a new age and so scared of, of the spirituality that's emerging is a great change. I think we're seeing the end of a patriarchal system that has been in operation for thousands of years. To me, the rise of the feminist understanding, the rise of feminine principles. I'm not just talking about women here. I'm talking about the feminine qualities of compassion, of understanding, of receptivity, of gentleness. Uh, what we need in order to survive as a species. History has evolved from there being goddesses as well as gods and that history moved into there being one god which was a male figure and I feel that coming back to an openness to there being a feminine side to God that that's bringing things back into balance again. Uh, the bear is very strong earthed and it growls a little bit. Music plays a very big role in my life and I've been working with um, a couple of musicians and we've made a number of tapes um, which are designed to get people into a space of celebration and of joy. It is new age music. I'm also a disc jockey um, for In Flight and I, I, I DJ a new age music show there as well. For me, the new age means that uh, everybody is free to make their own spiritual exploration. I used to like crystals. As my awareness has developed, I can feel the difference in um, the energy from, of one crystal to another. I meditate. A lot of my meditation practice at the moment is actually appreciating the, the countryside. Until the age of 27, I was an estate agent, and um, at that age I developed thrombosis, and it changed my life around. I got into homeopathy, into changing my diet, before that I'd been on hamburgers and coke. Got into meditation, before that I'd been smoking dope, and, um, and I found meditation took me to much nicer places without the side effects. At the moment I'm living at Moncton Wild Court Community, which is a community in Dorset. It's a community that's based on ecological values. We try and live more in harmony with, with the earth. I think living in a community like this is opting out in a way from mainstream living. Um, it could also be called an oasis. I think the churches are frightened of uh, new age and they're frightened of that which challenges their authority they have been a part of that patriarchal system since the birth of christ there is a fear that they're going to lose their power they're going to lose their authority they're going to lose their hold over people i don't reject other religions at all i encompass all religions as part of my new age belief 
through the new age, I'm able to create my own image of what I believe God to be. So are we really at the dawning of the new age of Aquarius or is new age just a passing trend? Can the new age movement be dismissed as reworked superstitions or does it contain a hidden agenda bringing impressionable people into direct competition with Christianity? And when the rise in new age coincides with the decline in Christian congregations, what is the new age saying to the church? Ronald, uh, Reverend Donald Reeves is rector of uh, St. James's Church, Piccadilly in London. It's an Anglican church that plays host to Alternatives, which is a New Age centre. Reverend Tony Higton is one of a growing number of clergy who are alarmed at the rise of the New Age. He's concerned that New Age poses a real threat to the Christian church. Tony Higton, what threat exactly? Well, I think that uh, the New Age is fundamentally at odds with uh, Christianity. I mean, Christianity is based on the fact that we are all sinners, we fall short of God's uh, standards, and it's only because Jesus died for us, uh, if we trust in him, that we can be saved, we can have eternal life. Now the new age is really saying that um, we need to change our sort of mental consciousness, we need to balance the right and left hand of our brain, we need to get into meditation and so on, and uh, then all will be well with the world, which I think is terribly naive. But that is their but view, but, but why is it a threat to the church? Well, I don't think it's a threat to the church as such, but I think that there are many people who are searching for God today, and Jesus said he was the way to God, and they're searching in the wrong direction. But what is uh, that, the danger? I'm more concerned trying, for them. What is, the, what is the danger of their trying to find their God through, through New Age? Because I think they're going in the wrong direction. They're going up a dead end, which will not lead them to God. What will it lead them to? Well, I think in some cases it leads them into the occult. I mean, I think it's a case, I don't know why Donald uh, actually en encourages this sort of thing in his own church well, building. You, can I, can I, uh, before you, yeah. I just want to be clear what you mean by the occult. I, want, I just want to be clear. I mean, it, it looked fairly innocent in that film. But what, what is it leading to? I mean, well, I think people start to dabble with things they don't understand. They get into mysticism and so on, and they open themselves to anything that might happen. Now, I don't believe in the devil in a medieval sense, you know, horns and hooves, but I do believe the devil is real, and people can open themselves to the occult when it's, it's wrapped up in, in, in pleasant, new, uh, apparently new terminology occult anyway. Occult is what? Witchcraft? Things like the that? The occult is witchcraft, yes, uh, right. invoking the spirits, etc. Can, so, we, can we leave out the dabbling aspects? I think we would both agree about that, I mean, the things that it can lead to. The thing that I learned from the New Age, not so much from that, that film, which I've known about the New Age now for 20 years, is they, that unlike organized religion, the New Age writers, some of them brought to my attention that uh, the sort of presentiment, the sort of warning that we have, that the earth is getting older, that uh, there are enormous changes going on in the world, that we are coming towards the end of a whole way of living and being and thinking and all the rest of it. And it was the New Age in the first place which highlighted that for me. And the other thing which I've learnt about the New Age is the, I mean it's impossible to generalise, but the sort of seriousness with which some people take the spiritual journey, which I find missing in organised religion. What I, can I just say something about it? The, the other thing is that organised religion has to listen to what New Age people are saying about the church. Because if I have over the years had so many comments and criticisms not just about the Church of England, but about all organized religion, which I think that people like ourselves, clergy, have to really listen to and attend to. Uh, to Tony, it is a spiritual search, um, so that's got to be good, hasn't it? I, I'm not condemning New Ages. I think they're searching for something which is good. My problem is, I'm concerned that they're searching in the wrong direction. But you know, Donald said he's, he, we would agree over dabbling in the occult, that it's bad. Mm. But uh, I mean, Donald, in your church, twice in the first six months of this year, there will be shamans, if you like, witch doctors, who are actually doing their thing. How can that be in an Anglican church? Is it not totally alien to the Christian faith? I think what you're talking about here is the sort of hospitality that we offer other people. Uh, this is not just New Ages, but it is uh, agnostics, atheists, Buddhists, Jews, Christians. It's the whole aspect of how we as a Christian community relate to people who think and feel uh, quite differently to us. Isn't, um, isn't it true, Tony, that, that to a certain extent the, the church must be blamed for the rise of New Age because, oh, because yes. of a certain lack of flexibility on yes. the part of, of people yes. like you? Yes. I mean, there are some churches that are spiritually dead. Uh, and I mean, I, I am one of the main critics within the Church of England of the church, constructively critical. I want to see the church really scratching New Ages where they're itching. 
I think people are, uh, think that church is irrelevant, and some churches are, some local churches, but they're really searching for God. But Jesus is the way. I mean, I can't understand why, Donald, you actually are, you, you talk about hospitality and yes. so on, but is it not actually collaboration with the enemy well, more than not. hospitality? When you invite someone to your house, you don't immediately hit them over the head and tell them exactly what to believe. You but invite you them in, you welcome them, you uh, respect their strangeness, you begin to trust one another, you begin to have conversations, you eat with one another, and so this awful word I can't stand called dialogue yes. uh, actually begins. It's the way that some poor. But operate. you're encouraging them to go in the wrong I, direction. Can I just you for a second? And actually, one final question. Isn't, isn't it it's hardly surprising that, that people are looking for a new kind of religion when they see such divisions in the church, such as you know, the, the division between you and many other important issues on which the church is divided. It's no wonder people are looking in other directions. Well, we, don't, we, don't, we don't stifle debate and discussion and disagreement. No. But my problem with Donald is I think he is encouraging in his church things which are alien to Christianity. It's not just hospitality, but it's actually inadvertently encouraging people down the wrong road. I'm sorry, but no, that, that's no, where we have, have to leave a very interesting discussion. for half an hour. I'm very so. sorry. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, the life of a top footballer is a glamorous, if perhaps godless, mixture of fast cars, expensive clothes and adoring fans. Yet almost half of England's professional clubs have taken the precaution of including a chaplain on the staff. The man in charge of souls rather than goals at Queen's Park Rangers in West London is Robert DeBerry. <laughs> of a church called St. Luke's West Kilburn. That's my full-time job. So being at QPR is an attractive but a fringe activity. If I described it as mooching around, uh, that's how it begins. But you're really doing the same sort of thing that you do in any Christian ministry. You are around. And I find that if you're around, then people talk. But it is very much a part-time activity. I tend to come down here at lunch times after training and sit around, talk, listen, and pick up on anything that people want to chat over with me. Robert does things uh, in his own way, and I think uh, from a religious and perhaps spiritual um, connection, for uh, whether it's players, players' wives, players' children, I think it's nice to have somebody perhaps that they could go to and talk to uh, about things that possibly they feel they can't talk to other people about. Well, unfortunately for me, last three years ago, I lost my mother, and Robert was around at the time, was able to talk to me and help me through a sticky period in my life. I think that the balance that I can bring is that here, the club emphasizes entirely this whole control of the body, but very often when you emphasize one thing, it is at the expense of something else. And the spiritual aspect of life is often absent. Occasionally, a player is very ready to receive prayer. Maybe they're in hospital and they're quite depressed because there's an awful lot of depression uh, because of injury. Uh, that is a time when it might be appropriate to pray. In a sense, a Christian is always longing that other people become Christians. But at the same time, I've never converted anybody because you find that this happens, in a sense, by God's own movement in people's lives. I'm here really just to be available to anybody. And that might mean staff at the ground. It might mean people who never appear up front but do very valuable work. When my wife was ill, Robert uh, went and supported her and went to the hospital on various occasions and, and prayed for her and he, he also spoke to me and I think it sort of opened my eyes and um, I think this is partly due for the reason that I now go to church regularly because as I say, you know, people pray when they need help but they also should pray when they don't need help. What's happening on Saturday again? Charlton. 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 Did you beat them? They stuffed us last night. They stuffed you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I see. I think part of a Christian's sort of job is, if you like, to prick consciences, to uh, raise issues, to stimulate discussion, and to get people thinking beyond their own material possessions and ambitions. And, and the drug pushers and all this, do you find that they sort of try to exploit the homeless people in that respect? Yeah. The idea 
behind arranging a meeting between homeless people and some of the first team players is really this. Here are people who are used to having no voice meeting those who get continual attention. And if those who receive attention can divert some of that attention towards those who are voiceless, that to me is a great plus. I try not to pray for results. I mean, if we're too down and there's 10 minutes to go, I might dash up a prayer, but really you're here to pray for people, not for results. The Reverend Robert DeBerry. The decision of the General Synod on November the 11th of last year to approve the ordination of women set a number of people on the road to Rome. The Social Security Minister Anne Widdicombe, the highest profile defector so far, crossed the floor on April the 21st and was officially received into the Catholic Church. Listing the ordination of women as just one of the problems she had with the Church of England, Anne Widdicombe says that she's looking for a church that puts faith before fashion and creed before compromise. Well, what does the future hold for her? And is there a future for the church she left behind? Anne, why did you feel that you had to join Rome? Well, the last straw was indeed the ordination of women, uh, because I say in the creed each week, and did as an Anglican, that I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And as far as I was concerned, once the Synod had taken its decision on the 11th of November, I could no longer apply that description to the Church of England. But even before that had happened, I had been tempted towards Rome, uh, because I found it very difficult indeed to have respect for a church which, for example, uh, appoints a bishop who publicly questions uh, articles of creed. But, but as a Conservative, don't you value the place that Anglicanism holds in British culture? It's long been known as the Tory party at prayer. Let me make it quite clear that I, I want to see the Church of England remain the established church of this country. Uh, I've no desire to see it weakened to such a point that, that, that it can't be that. Uh, but I simply felt that uh, the Church of England that I had once known and the Church of England that I found myself in uh, in middle age uh, were not the same thing. But doesn't your very public criticism and defection undermine the Anglican Church? Well, I hope not. I made it very clear yesterday when I addressed a rally that that was the last time certainly that I would address Anglicans on that subject but precisely because I didn't want to undermine the Church. But on the other hand, I have crossed. Um, people have noticed that I've crossed to a very much larger extent than even I expected. Uh, it would be wholly wrong for me not to bear witness as to why I've crossed. Now, you've said that the opposition that you have to the ordination of women has nothing to do with women's rights. Why? Not at all. For example, um, if the uh, papal nuncio were not a priest and there is a school of thought which says he doesn't have to be, I'd be quite happy to see a female papal nuncio in the Catholic Church. Uh, my objections are not to uh, women holding the highest lay positions in the church, certainly not to women holding the highest secular positions outside the church. My objections are purely to the priesthood and its authority is derived from the apostolic succession. The apostles were all men. But how does that affect your own image of yourself as a woman? Why couldn't you become a priest? Because I am not a successor of the apostles. It's as simple as that. It's not an argument that I expect outsiders to understand. But it is an argument that I would have expected to have de been debated more fully at Synod, which showed me a very, very unfortunate concentration on the secular side and the women's rights side and, and women's liberation side, all of which have a huge place in the secular world. But there is a theological overriding objection to this. But there are a lot of women who have a calling and a deeply held faith in that calling. Can you deny their belief, their faith? There is much that they can do in the church. Uh, without actually being ordained to the priesthood. The Church of England has had women deacons for a very long time. Uh, women can uh, fulfill a lot of lay positions and do it very well indeed. Uh, it is purely a question of the theological construction of the priesthood. But the faith, the faith that you have a calling, is that not given by God? I believe, obviously, it is God who calls us and we either hear his call uh, or we don't. But we can also sometimes, I think, uh, misinterpret that call. And all I would say is that I do not believe it is possible uh, for a woman to be a priest if we are believing, and, and don't forget some branches of the church don't, 
if we are believing uh, that the priesthood is derived from the apostolic succession. How will you respond if the movement for ordination of women in the Roman Catholic Church succeeds? Oh, come on. We've only just forgiven Galileo. You don't think we're going to go and ordain women priests, do you? <laughs> I don't know. They're asking for it. What, what do you actually hope to get from the Catholic Church that you can't get from Anglicanism? Isn't it very different from that sort of ground orthodoxy that people think is the norm? Uh, I think certainly there is a distorted view of the Catholic Church. Indeed, I've seen that reflected in my post bag. I, I think people very often have a, a picture of the Catholic Church as a sort of totally authoritarian, totalitarian setup. Uh, and in fact, there is a lot of debate within the Catholic Church. But the fact remains is that the Holy See uh, does not promulgate doctrine and does not promulgate belief uh, according to what is fashionable. Um, and that is why, of course, um, the Catholic Church represents something like 65% of Christendom. But you've had trouble, I know, with some yes. things, purgatory particularly. Yes. Have you truly been able to embrace that and make your move a really positive move? I think that, oh, quite obviously, I did have major difficulties. If I had no difficulties, I would have applied to Rome on November the 12th. And the fact that it took me another four 